I think funerals, a bit like special birthdays and graduation ceremonies, they're really big milestones in people's journey through life. Um, and I think particularly during this pandemic, the funerals have been really, really important to people. But I know they've also been really different because of some of the restrictions that have been in place. And I wondered how you found that as a celebrant working with families. It's very different, for sure. Um, particularly from the, the get-go, you get the call from the funeral director or even directly from the family and you cannot then just turn up at their home. And I think that's quite an important part of it for them. It's almost quite cathartic that they're able to sit down. They're a little apprehensive when you come in, but you're able to sit down and properly put them at ease. We have a cup of tea, we chat, you know, the good stuff, the warm stuff, and we can't do that now. So um, I've been working using um, kind of generic questions initially, and I'll phone them and say, look, ap apologies that it is quite generic. Just fill in what you can in terms of facts and figures. I will handwrite out a kind of template of who's who in the family. Um, but then we'll arrange a call or a video call, preferably, sort of, you know, uh, in a week's time, if I've got, depending how much time we have, to properly get into the details and the, and the good stuff. Um, so it's been an adjustment, certainly. And I'm quite used to it now, but it, it did take a little while to get to grips with it. What about you? I think it's been a learning curve for everyone, myself included, and also the families that, that we're working with. I know that one family that I worked with, I think it was the first time that the, that the grandmother had, had used Zoom. <laughs> and she was very quiet for the first 10 or 15 minutes and she let all the other family members tell their stories. And then I think she warmed to it. And then obviously she had to disagree with one of the grandchildren's um, versions of the story. And that's when she chipped in. And once she started, there, you know, there was absolutely no stopping her in terms of telling all these stories and having all these wonderful memories as well. And the other thing that I noticed about doing it online was that we're now able to involve more family members or close friends that maybe wouldn't have been practical at a family visit at their home because, you know, other family might, members might be in different countries or they might have other commitments so they wouldn't be able to speed across town after working time. Um, so I've had to actually had more people um, to speak to when I've been doing it online. I'm not sure if that's been the same experience for you. That's really interesting because, well, I don't know whether it's the, the, the area that I'm working in or the funeral directors that I work regularly with, but a lot of their um, clients, customers, whatever you want to call them, our families are not very computer savvy. In fact, they're not very tech literate in any, in any way or f shape or form. Um, I've had in the past where they've actually just written on a piece of paper and taken a photograph of it and sent it on a text and I think, right, <laughs> and it's challenging but I've got, I've managed it so I thought, oh, this is going to be really hard for them when it comes to operating video. So often it's not on a video call for me. I'd like it to be and I try to encourage that but it, it doesn't always pan out that way and, then, and I can feel that apprehension on the end of the phone where they sort of say, oh, well, what about this and will you say that? And often a younger family member will step in and help with the technology in terms of answering email questions and etc. And then once the first draft is sent, they all relax into it a bit. They can see that it's what they wanted and you know how they wanted it but yeah it's definitely a challenge especially if they don't do a video call I don't know on the day when I turn up who's who it's like for me luckily with so few people I can sort of work out who must be who but it's a it's so strange I think also all the masks are very strange as well I know that the first burial that I did during during um, just after lockdown and everyone was wearing masks and even although I'd had a video call, I, I still couldn't, couldn't recognise the individuals because of their masks. Yep, it's definitely, um, it's def I do more cremations than burials, but um, it's so hard to not go up and put your arms around them. That, that took a lot of getting used to. Um, however, I have had some people say, oh, you're not worried about you know, going into a crematorium. I think actually it's far cleaner than any supermarket I'd ever walk into. Sometimes when I put my book down on the lectern, it's still wet from having been cleaned down so I think no I re that really doesn't concern me um, people that are so careful and safe it's just it's just that kind of distance now that we have to keep that's quite sad it is I think it's hard for all of us isn't it because you have to go against your your natural instinct to go and give someone a hug or shake hands with them um, well I think when it initially started people were so shocked that they had to 
so few people there. They couldn't get their, you know, their kind of um, nearest and dearest, all of them that they wanted. And it was really upsetting. Now, as time goes on, they're becoming more used to it. And in a way, you know, perhaps live streaming or, um, you know, the fact that we actually print our ceremonies off and give them a copy or give them a digital copy they can share with other people that couldn't be there is, is quite a bonus, I think. Yeah, I think that Humanist Society Scotland celebrants are very good at that, aren't they? You know, we do give the family either a hard copy or now more likely a digital copy, yeah. but it's something that they, they can hang on to, isn't it? It's something that they can share beyond the people that were there on the day, which I think is also very important. Actually, at the moment, I'm writing a living funeral. I've got two um, people who really know that their time is coming to an end and very much want to be a part of what is said and how it's said and done. And I think their fear in the, under these current circumstances are that it'll be very clipped and short and impersonal. And that's been lovely to spend time on emails, videos and getting to know someone very, what a privilege to know that you're actually writing what they want and it's absolutely their choice of music and their funny stories and there'll probably be a few raised eyebrows but they love the thought of that <laughs> and I think that's great. Yeah, what a wonderful thing to be part of. Mm. Have you ever written a living funeral? I haven't, no. Gosh, well, let's see. I've, I've done three, I think, uh, yeah, so... Let's wait and see. I wonder if I wonder if we'll see more demand for that type of ceremony. I have I have done um, advanced wishes um, for people, and I think that's also very reassuring to them because, as you've explained, it means that they've got more input yeah. into the ceremony and the stories that are told. Um, but very much with the instruction that this is to be used after they've died. Hard thing to face, hard thing for the family to watch, but in a way much easier for them when the time comes because the family don't have to worry about it being correct or being what they would have wanted. It's a hugely considerate thing to do actually to think that far ahead and to think about removing the burden on the family from from making all of those decisions or having to rack their bra brains in the moment of that deep grief as well. Um, but it also very nice in that one of them she specifically asked me to meet the family and um, let them read what we'd written together and also to input their own stories in addition to that. So it did change, it evolved the script. I'm sure, I'm sure they all will evolve when, when the actual the time comes, but the, uh, the bones of it are there, shall we say, and that's, that's, uh, it is a privilege. And people are kind of, oh, how, can you, how can anyone do that? But I think if we could all just be a bit more brave and honest and open when, when we know that there's the inevitab inevitability is there, it would be amazing. I've actually, you know, when, we, when I first became a celebrant with Humanist Society Scotland, of course, the training, they, they give you sort of a list of questions, or be rough questions that you should ask on a family visit. And often um, I have friends who've said, can I have a copy of these questions from my parents who are still alive? Because I know what's going to happen. I don't know this stuff and I never ask them. And there's a way of finding out without feeling I'm sitting them down and interrogating them. But I think that's great. I've shared that list with quite a few people and they've been so grateful for it, thinking, you know, it could be tight a long time before anything happens, but at least I got those questions in about where did you go to school? What kind of person were you? Were you, were you naughty? Were you funny? Were you, did you hate school? Did you love it? That kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I think it's something we should all have access to or think about. You know, could you honestly answer where your parents went to school and what kind of people they were if they're in their 80s now? It's a, it's a really valuable exercise and that reminiscence work is really therapeutic and fascinating as well, isn't it? So it's lovely to sit down and, and do that with, with your family. I don't know what your diary looks like for 2020, 2021. Mine is like Spaghetti Junction because I'm a paper girl. I also have a digital one, but I love a paper diary. And the weddings have just been decimated with reschedule, re-reschedule, re-reschedule. Ah, how have you found it? Yeah, my, my spreadsheet was the, probably the equivalent of that, I think. And I, I would say that the majority of my couples all postponed because they had their hearts set on the, on the big wedding and they realised they weren't going to be able to do that. So a lot of them did postpone. But some of them did go small. Um, and I think that was really nice as well. You know, they had to uninvite guests from the big wedding um, in the big hotel and then have a really nice, personal, meaningful ceremony with a small, select group of family in their back garden. And those wee weddings are really, really beautiful. They're paired back 
and but they're all about the couple and celebrating their love um, and I think it's wonderful also to see that other couples are now using this as an opportunity I think to 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 really embrace having a wee wedding and focusing on what's important. Um, I actually think it's been a bit of a revelation uh, to for couples who have like you say, they've rescheduled till next year, maybe early next year. Now they're realising, no, yeah, it's going to be a long time before you can have 100 plus people anywhere. Um, so, you know, they, they push back, push back, and then suddenly they remember why they're doing it. And actually, this is just about getting married. Or perhaps they have a terminally ill parent or very elderly guests that they would love to have be part of it. And actually, the whole point is who's there, not the party, not the drinks, the party. All that. that can all happen way down the line. It doesn't matter. Um, so those, I'm, I'm now seeing a sudden flurry of weddings all rushing in before the end of the year. I'm thinking, what? Um, and that's great because they're, they're suddenly thinking this is the most important thing is we get married and uh, let's not worry about the rest of the stuff that can all be sorted later on. Um, and when they do do the small weddings, without fail, they've all said, I'm so glad we did it this way. The pressure was off. The nerves were cut back. It was so much more relaxed. They weren't worrying about seating and feeding 100 people. They weren't worried about this cake on a swing. Yes, I've had a cake on a swing. Um, you know, the, the, all the other stuff that comes with weddings, which is lovely if that's what you're into. But actually, secretly, I think I'm now preferring this, <laughs> the wee weddings and the, and the, you know, kind of intimacy of that and the importance of that. And it's also taken the pressure off a lot, saying, well, God, all these people we thought we'd have to invite and... He didn't want to, and I did, and she didn't want to, and, and suddenly they're going, oh, sorry, can't have you. <laughs> so, yeah, I've really, I've found it quite a, an epiphany. <laughs> That's the word I can use. I've found it really um, eye-opening and brings it all back down to reality. It's lovely. And you're right, the new bookings are wee weddings from the outset, aren't they? And more people choosing to elope as well, I've noticed as well. Mm. Um, and... There's some really lovely creative things people are doing with their vows and their symbolic gestures as well. I know we there was this restriction where we weren't allowed to include food and drink in the ceremony. So I had one couple where they had a quake that had been gifted by the father of the groom, um, engraved with a bottle of whiskey. And they both held the quake during their ceremony and we talked about it. Um, and the photographer captured a wonderful picture of the couple with their reflection in the base of the silver quake as well and they were going to share a drink from it after the ceremony. So that was lovely and hand fasting a revelation to me as well because I've always done the hand fasting or I've invited family members to come up and be involved in it and of course none of that was possible under the restrictions unless the family member happened to be from the same household. So I learned a new hand fasting that the couple could do themselves. Um, and it was great just to see the couple do it independently. It was your heart in your mouth. <laughs> was your heart in your mouth saying, so far it's not failed. <laughs> I'm going to ask you for some tips afterwards then on how to do that because that scares the life out of me. <laughs>
someone will have it, absolutely. And coming from a job that I had before, which is very focused on appearance, age, um, and the experience was pretty far down the line, I have just loved doing this job because I totally bow to experience and that is so important. And I think it doesn't matter whether I've got the right dress on or whether I've two pounds heavier than I was last week or that doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is can I do it? Can I deliver a service that's right for the family, right for the couple? Um, and I'm so delighted to really kind of see that it's kind of restored my faith in humanity a bit because these, um, these exp more experienced celebrants, I could not have done it without them. Absolutely not. And we know that our colleagues have got our back as well in case of an emergency. And, and the Humanist Society Scotland promise is just worth so much, I think, both for the families and couples that we work with, but also for ourselves. And I know that only on one occasion, fortunately, that I've had to call that in um, and get, get another celebrant to step in for me. And, it, you know, that meant so much to me and was so important to the wedding couple that it affected as well. Do you think you've learned anything from lockdown about you as a person or you as a celebrant? I think there's just really that importance of reaching out to your friends and family. It's even more important now. And I feel it really for my, for my parents um, because they're quite elderly and they would be in a shielding category as well um, and how isolating it is for them. Even although they're only a mile from my house, I still can't go in and spend time with them. So I've been doing lots of walks <laughs> more walking than I've ever done and during lockdown we you know we made a point of taking advantage of our daily exercise I've done more exercise than I've ever done before have you got a dog I don't have a dog but I have a child which is almost as good <laughs> so we've got two dogs who have been walked <laughs> to within an inch of their lives my main concern was when we came out of lockdown what they were going to do because there weren't going to be this wealth of people around them constantly wanting to take them out but um I think more important than anything has been family and having them around. I don't have any uh, parents, nor, nor does my husband. And in some ways, I'm, I was quite grateful for that at this stage because I feel they would never have understood this. They passed away a long time ago, as did my husband's. Um, but watching friends go through worrying about either care home visiting or you know, just getting to see them or making sure they were okay, was I, I, it must have been awful. Nor did I have to homeschool, which I think you did. <laughs> So with my children all being that bit older, um, yeah, it was it was a busy house, uh, but I'm and I really enjoyed spending that time with them. Um, that I would wasn't expecting to be spending with them because you know we're they're older now. However, um, more than anything, I think it's taught you need to get out in fresh air. You're absolutely right, um, and put some structure in your day because it can just disappear having done absolutely nothing. All these little jobs that I was wanting to do for a long time, everything's fixed. <laughs> Everything's painted. I can't think of anything else to do. I started making hand fasting ties <laughs> and I and I contacted all my wedding couples for miles ahead to say, well, if you're sitting at home and you're not a key worker, why don't you crack on with your homework and tell me your story, write that down now, don't wait till the, when, you know, things are all busy up again and then you can't, so you got no excuse. <laughs> so I went a bit school marmy on them, but hey, it worked. <laughs> I mean, one of the nice things has been with people spending more time at home and you know spending more time cooking and baking and reading books and um, all of those things that you know we think we should be doing we've had more opportunity to do them um, which is something that I've really really loved and appreciated um, also enjoyed you know meeting with friends online as well which was a bit awkward at the beginning um, but I think it's become a lot more natural now and the conversations do flow that was weird, wasn't it? When you saw your friends on screen, you got so excited, thinking, oh, and I think that's ridiculous. She's only down the road, and I, but she's on the screen, and I'm so excited to see her. And we've learned not to talk over each other now. Um, it's still not the same as seeing someone in person, but we'll get there, I'm sure. The other really good thing that came out of lockdown, I think, was kindness and neighbours. I've lived in the same street for over 20 years, and I know some of them, but I didn't know all of them. And the clap on a Thursday night, we all came out and we used the wheelie bins because they were collected the next morning to put a glass of wine on too. <laughs> and we chatted and we stayed out there for about an hour every week. And we, we all started to look forward to it. Um, I was doing shopping for elderly neighbours, just 
And I think they all kind of really enjoyed that community spirit that had not been there before. So I think that was a good thing. What were your neighbours like? I agree. We really enjoyed our, our Thursday evenings and people got quite into it, banging pots and <laughs> <laughs> bringing out glasses of wine. I think it depends what neighbourhood you live in as well. I do feel quite fortunate where I live. I think it's a lot, it can be a lot tougher for some people and I do have friends stuck in really small flats with lots of small children trying to work from home um, and I'm always in awe at what they, what they manage amongst the chaos. <laughs> Doesn't bear thinking about it. <laughs>